Hey everyone, welcome back to another lesson. This lesson is on vitamin B7 or biotin deficiency. So we're going to start by introducing what biotin or vitamin B7 is. It's also known as vitamin H. And vitamin B7 is a water-soluble vitamin. It is actually one of eight B vitamins, and this is what it looks like here. Now, why do we need biotin? It's actually required for several processes. One of those is gluconeogenesis. So gluco, meaning glucose, and neogenesis, meaning new formation. So new formation of glucose. And it's new formation of glucose from other nutrient substrates. We'll talk a bit more about this in the next slide. It's also involved in branched chain amino acid catabolism, or breakdown of branched chain amino acids. And it's involved in fatty acid synthesis. And in doing so, in being involved in some of these processes, it's also important in the maintenance of skin, nail, and hair health. Where do we actually get vitamin B7 or biotin? So we can get it from our diet. So dietary sources of vitamin B7 or biotin include egg yolk. So egg yolk is quite rich in biotin. We can also get it in salmon, pork, oats, and wheat, mushrooms, dairy, spinach, and rice. And there's also gut microbe synthesis. So you have certain populations of bacteria within your gastrointestinal system that can actually produce biotin. And these gut microbes can actually synthesize a significant amount of biotin as well. Now, the recommended daily intake of biotin is recommended to be 30 micrograms per day. So this is the recommended daily intake. So why do we need biotin in the first place? So we talked about gluconeogenesis, fatty acid synthesis, and branching amino acid catabolism. It's actually involved as a cofactor with five different enzymes, five carboxylase enzymes. So one of those is pyruvate carboxylase. Another one is three methyl crotonyl CoA carboxylase. Another one is acetyl CoA carboxylase one and acetyl CoA carboxylase two. And another one is propionyl CoA carboxylase. So you don't need to know all of these, but I'll tell you what each one is responsible for. So with regards to pyruvate carboxylase, pyruvate carboxylase is involved in gluconeogenesis in the liver and to a smaller amount in the kidney during times of fasting and starvation. So your body produces glucose because your red blood cells require glucose as an energy source. So what happens is during times of fasting and starvation, if you have low levels of glucose, your body will produce it through gluconeogenesis from other nutrient substrates in order for your red blood cells to have an energy source. And pyruvate carboxylase is critical in this process because it has to go around an irreversible step with regards to pyruvate kinase. So again, you don't need to know all this, but just recognize that pyruvate carboxylase is involved in gluconeogenesis. Now, with regards to 3-methylcrotonyl-CoA carboxylase, this is involved in metabolism of leucine, and leucine is one of the branched chain amino acids. So leucine, isoleucine, and valine are the branched chain amino acids, and 3-methylcrotonyl-CoA carboxylase is involved in the metabolism of leucine, and we need biotin with regards to this carboxylase. And with regards to acetyl-CoA carboxylase 1 and 2, these are the committed steps in fatty acid synthesis. So biotin also plays a role with these enzymes as well. And propionyl-CoA carboxylase is involved in the metabolism of valine and isoleucine, so the other two branching amino acids. So again, biotin plays an important role with these enzymes with regards to gluconeogenesis, metabolism of valine, isoleucine, and leucine, and fatty acid synthesis. So how is vitamin B7 absorbed and excreted? So we talked about getting vitamin B7 from dietary sources like egg yolk and also from gut microbe synthesis. So we're going to talk about when we ingest the biotin from dietary sources. We'll talk about what happens. So when we actually ingest it in our diet, it enters into our gastrointestinal system. And if it's protein-bound biotin, if it's bound to another protein in a food source, we have to free it into free biotin in order for us to absorb it. And it gets absorbed in the small intestine. And interestingly, and I'll make a point here to note this, in uncooked eggs, so in eggs that are not cooked, there is a protein avidin, and this protein prevents the absorption of biotin. So we talked about egg yolk being a source that is quite rich in biotin, but if it's not cooked, no matter how much biotin is in that egg yolk, if it's uncooked, avidin is present in its natural form. It binds to the biotin, preventing its absorption. When you cook eggs, avidin becomes denatured and does not 
prevent the absorption of biotin. So you can actually absorb biotin when you've cooked the eggs because the avidin becomes denatured. So just a quick note there. And once you have absorbed the biotin, it enters into the bloodstream and eventually will be excreted in the renal system, in the kidney, in the form of urine. So again, very brief mechanism as to how vitamin B7 is absorbed and excreted. So what are some of the causes of a biotin deficiency? So we talked about we require it from our diet, but we can also get it from gut microbe synthesis. So because we get a significant amount from gut microbe synthesis, it can actually be quite rare to see certain biotin deficiencies or very severe biotin deficiencies, but you could see a biotin insufficiency, so not quite having enough. But we'll just talk about some of the categories of potential causes here. So one of those category of causes is poor dietary intake. So we talked about getting biotin from dietary sources. If you're not eating enough, then this can cause a biotin deficiency. So one of the patient populations you'll see most often with deficiencies is patients with chronic alcoholism. Again, multiple factors as to why this occurs, but one of them is because they're not eating enough, but it can also actually prevent the absorption of biotin itself. We can also see it in consumption of raw egg whites. We talked about avidin being present and preventing the absorption of biotin. So if an individual is consuming a lot of raw egg whites, this can actually lead to a biotin deficiency as well. Parenteral nutrition can also cause a biotin deficiency. So if individuals are getting nutrients through IV lines and other mechanisms, this can lead to a biotin deficiency and malnutrition in general as well. Another category of causes is decreased bacterial synthesis. So again, we talked about gut microbes being a significant source of biotin. And if there's decreased bacterial synthesis, we can see a biotin deficiency. We can see it with inflammatory bowel disease. So in general, there are issues within the gastrointestinal system that can lead to decreased bacterial synthesis and broad spectrum antibiotics. So this can lead to wiping out of gut microbes. So individuals on broad spectrum antibiotics could lead to a potential biotin deficiency because they've essentially wiped out those gut microbes that are producing a lot of biotin for them. Another category of causes is decreased absorption. So again, we can see this with inflammatory bowel disease, inflammation in the gastrointestinal system from diseases like Crohn's disease can prevent the proper absorption of vitamins in general, and biotin is one of them. GI surgery, so again, if an individual has large portions of their gastrointestinal system removed due to surgery, they have decreased surface area, preventing them from absorbing nutrients and vitamins properly. And again, alcoholism. We talked about this before. This can lead to poor dietary intake, but also a decreased ability to absorb biotin as well. Another category of causes is medications, so anticonvulsants, so anti-seizure medications. And this may play a role in this next category we're going to talk about, increased catabolism or increased breakdown of biotin. So you may be getting it, you may be absorbing it, but your body is breaking it down. And the anticonvulsants might be doing this, and we can see this with smoking. So women who smoke have been shown to have increased catabolism or increased breakdown of biotin. So the anticonvulsants may also fit in with this category as well. And we can see it with genetics. So there's a genetic condition known as biotinidase deficiency, and this can lead to a biotin deficiency as well. So what are some of the clinical features of a biotin deficiency? We'll first talk about the integumentary system. So the integumentary system includes the skin and hair and other related structures. So the first one is hair loss. So we can see hair loss with a biotin deficiency. We can also see scaly dermatitis. So inflammation of the skin and it's a scaly appearance and it's noted to be periorificial so we find it's around the orifices and we can see this on the face and we can see something called a biotin deficient face we can see dry skin as well with a biotin deficiency and we can also see conjunctivitis as well so an inflammation of the conjunctiva of the eyes Another system that is affected by a biotin deficiency is the neurological system. So we can see lethargy, depression, even hallucinations in some cases, paresthesias on extremities, so numbness and tingling sensation, hypotonia, so decreased tone, and ataxia, and even seizures in some cases. And in children, we can see developmental delay. So it's important to 
recognize, again, those children with a biotinidase deficiency, that genetic condition. So recognize it and then treat them with biotin supplements. So how is a biotin deficiency evaluated and treated? So a biotin deficiency is evaluated or diagnosed by measuring the urine excretion of biotin and 3-hydroxy isovaleric acid. So I'll briefly talk about this here. So we talked about biotin being involved in some of those branch chain amino acid metabolism pathways. And when there's not enough biotin, some of those intermediates in those pathways get rerouted and get processed into other components or other products. And one of them is 3-hydroxy isovaleric acid. So we can see in a biotin deficiency, higher levels of 3-hydroxy isovaleric acid. And with regards to the number, it is greater than 195 micromoles per day. So that would indicate a biotin deficiency. And with regards to the biotinidase deficiency, genetic analysis is performed to assess for this genetic condition. So once a biotin deficiency has been diagnosed, how is it treated? So clinicians want to identify and treat the underlying cause first. In some cases, that's not possible, and this will lead to the need of a biotin supplementation. With regards to biotinidase deficiency patients, they require lifelong biotin supplementation because they will always have the issue with decreased biotin. Now, if you've watched my other lessons on thyroid diseases, you'll know that I've talked about this before, but I want to mention it here as well because we're talking about biotin supplementation. High levels of biotin supplementation can interfere with thyroid function tests. So it's just important to recognize this as well. And this can actually cause a false positive finding of Graves' disease. So it can look like Graves' disease when clinicians look at the thyroid function test results, but it's actually not Graves' disease. It's just due to the biotin supplementation. So I just wanted to make a quick note of that here. So if you want to learn more about other vitamin deficiencies, please check out my lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.